Okay. You know what they would say in Australia? They would say, Didi, you're a legend. She is a so, legend. In her own mind. She is. Well done. So are we recording right now? We are. Okay, wonderful. So um, just very, very briefly, everyone, um, look to the right. Do you recognize Lynette, the one crouching down a little bit? Uh, she's not at our Bible study today, but um, she sent me this because um, her and her friends that she's known for many years, her friends uh, took her out to celebrate her birthday. So they did a fun thing. They went and got their pictures taken. Uh, and it says that she's been in prison for being drunk again. But uh, we know that it's only fun. But I wanted to bring that up. And I should, pity she's not here, but hopefully she'll watch the recording. And so, Lynette, we bless you. And we want to say happy birthday to you. And we also want to say, and I hope it's okay to share this, that we share in your grief at the passing of your very, very dear mother who just passed away recently. And we know that you're grieving and we're grieving with you. And we pray for comfort. We pray for peace and we pray for good memories. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dee Dee. You're welcome. And we want to dedicate this Bible study to the memory of your mother, Lynette. We want to dedicate this study to her. And so let's pray, everyone, as we open up. Father God, we ask your blessing on this Bible study as we open your word. And uh, we pray that you'd open our minds, our heart, that we would receive um, deep spiritual truths from your word. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Good to be back with you. And we're studying uh, the book of Leviticus again, we're at chapter nine and we're at the parasha Shmini. Shmini is from the word Shmona, which means eight. Okay. And it's from Leviticus nine, verse one, which says, <coughs> and it came to pass on the eighth day that Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. Kara Moshe laharon ulebanav Yisrael bayom hashmini. So, the eighth day, now most of us know that eight is always or usually symbolic of a new cycle, a new cycle. Six days of creation, the seventh day rest, and then the beginning of a new week, uh, eight, okay? And um, I've mentioned this a number of times, the importance in the scriptures right from the creation story where God put the, the sun, the moon and the stars. And, he, and it says he put them for signs, for signs. The astrologers used to go by the, the, the galaxy, the new moons and the festivals. God tells us to each year throughout each generation, observe them. They're not a mistake. They are, they are for our good. Even, uh, even in the physical, a woman is created and every month she has a cycle. This is something beautiful that God created for the woman. In fact, in some cultures, the very first time a girl has her cycle, uh, it's a whole family and community celebration. Did you know that? In some cultures, they actually celebrate it. And in, in, in a lot of Western cultures, it's a very taboo subject, but um, this is part of God's creation. So the, the idea of the eighth day, uh, a new cycle, um, and uh, uh, the, the, the importance of understanding the cycles that the Lord has in all of our lives and the seasons. Ecclesiastes 3, to everything, there is a time and a purpose under heaven. And this is the key part of it. We've got to look at it from the perspective of under heaven. 
And when, when Solomon wrote that in the book of Ecclesiastes, he compared and contrasted looking at things under heaven and looking at things purely from a, uh, a humanistic point of view, which he called chasing after the wind. It's meaningless. So how are we looking at our lives? How are we looking at world events? How are we looking at what's happening in Israel and biblical prophecy? Is it just a political happening or is everything under heaven? And um, I know there's a risk here at being too spiritual, too heavenly minded, but I'd I think I'd rather lean towards that. Um, for me, it's a safer place to be. The, 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 this is, I think, part of putting on the, the sh or holding up the shield of faith, doing everything by faith. Okay. And by the way, uh, that verse that I quoted before, Matthew 24, listen to what the Lord said when he was talking about the end days. He said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. Okay? We, we sometimes pray against things like it shall be like the days of Noah or like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, we should pray against these things. But on the other hand, all these things must come to pass. So sometimes when we pray, we need to be careful because sometimes we can actually be praying against God's will or at least against God's prophetic word that must come to pass. So um, it's not easy praying sometimes for the situation in Israel and even for our own lives. So um, now we read Leviticus 9.1 and it happened on the eighth day. So the question arises, what happened the last seven days? What happened? Go to Leviticus 8. Verse 33. And friends, our study today, the theme of our study is consecration unto the Lord. Consecration unto the Lord. Leviticus 8.33. And you, this is what the Lord said to Aaron and his sons. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you as he has done this day. So the Lord has commanded to do to make an atonement for you. Notice how it says the Lord will make an atonement for you at the end of verse 34. Therefore, shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night, seven days. And keep the charge of the Lord that you die not. For I so command. So Aaron and his sons did all things which the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. Notice verse 35. You shall abide at the door of the tabernacle. When I read that verse, you know what I thought of? I thought of one of the Lord's statement, statements in John, John's gospel. I am the door. And I often wondered what was the Lord referring to? And maybe he was referring to this passage because the tabernacle is the house of God. It's, by the way, some rabbis teach that the pattern of the tabernacle is simply a pattern from the heavens down on the earth. So where it says you shall abide at the door of the tabernacle, stay there that you die not. In other words, if you live in that house, you shall have life. Did not the Lord also say in John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So this whole pattern, this whole context, we're in the tabernacle, everyone. We're in God's house. The beginning of the book of Leviticus is the Lord called Moses. The Lord called Aaron. It's an invitation to come into his house but right now we're talking about aaron needs to be now consecrated prepared set apart for his role in the tabernacle for his function 
in the tabernacle, which was to be a priest. And guys, that's our call. That's our high call. Not just to be set apart, not just to be saved out of darkness, but saved for a purpose. And our purpose is to be a kingdom of priests. Now, we know, you and I know, and those of you who are watching this recording, we know that this is a, this is a very costly thing. Following the Lord, consecrating our whole, whole lives is a very costly thing. And it almost feels like we're climbing a mountain and it's too high for us. But here's the thing. The, 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 there was what was called the outer court. There was the holy place. And then there was the holy of holies. There was the light of the outer court. There was the menorah light in the holy place. And then there was the light of God. There was the manna outside. There was the shoe bread in the holy place. And then there was the hidden manna. What am I trying to say, everyone? Even though it's a challenge, it's difficult, this consecration, this sacrificing everything. Guys, there are rewards. That's the point here. And what are the rewards? The rewards is the Lord. And that's not just a flippant religious jargon here, everyone. The Lord put it in this way when he talked about the pearl of, the, of great price. A man, he had everything and he sold it all to buy this pearl. And this is what we got to keep our eyes on. Yes, it is a sacrifice. Yes, we are giving up, but it's not for nothing. We gain more of the Lord. So now, here there's a warning. There's a warning in this whole area of priesthood and the whole area of consecration. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. The story of Avihu and Nadab, the sons of Aaron, brought up in a good believing home. And what did they do? And Nadav and Ahivu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them their censer and put fire in it and put incense thereon, very religious. And they offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. Now, there's two suggestions what the strange fire is. Actually, there's a number of suggestions, but the two main ones, number one, main one, is that it was presumptuous. It was irreverent. It was done out of their own volition. The Lord didn't command them. That's what it said, which the Lord commanded not at the, verse, at the end of verse one. The other suggestion is that the sons of Aaron had been drinking. They'd been drinking alcohol, and perhaps they were even drunk. Now, what does it mean, everyone, to be drunk? And I, I wrote here a number of synonyms, what it means to be drunk. Plastered, hammered, sloshed, pickled, wrecked, loaded, blotto, legless, bladdered, incapable, paralytic. Does that bring back any memories to anyone? I hope not. But in any event, the Lord spoke. Why it's believed, by the way, why it's believed that they could, they may well have been drunk is because straight after the Lord consumed them with fire, straight after in verse eight of chapter 10 of Leviticus, look what it says. The Lord spoke to Aaron saying, do not drink wine or strong drink, you or your sons, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation. Okay, that's why it's believed that they may well have been drinking. It doesn't say don't drink at all. It says when you come into the tabernacle of the congregation, you are not to drink. So. Uh, guys, what does it mean to be drunk? And a couple of definitions. One 
is having your faculties impaired by alcohol, number one. Number two, to be dominated by an intense feeling. Because you, and it's not just by alcohol that you can be drunk. You can be drunk. Have you heard the term? That man is drunk with rage. Or, or remember when Hannah was mourning because she couldn't have children. And Eli, her husband, he, he thought she was drunk. And she was actually grieving. And then look at the early church. They were drunk in the spirit. They were so joyous and happy. They were intoxicated with the spirit. So um, uh, how, here's an interesting, I did a study and we'll just look at it very briefly, but I think it's really important. How does one actually get drunk, everyone? When, l listen carefully, when you drink alcohol, the water-soluble ethanol it contains has a free pass throughout your body. So it's like a, like a worm, like a car driving in your body. After it enters your digestive system, it takes a ride into your bloodstream. It passes through cell membranes and strolls through the heart. It especially likes to hang out in the brain where it becomes a central nervous system depressant. And while in the brain, ethanol wanders around, causes feel-good dopamine to be released and links up with nerve receptors. Of these receptors, ethanol particularly binds to glutamate, a neurotransmitter that normally excites neurons. And that's all I'm going to read. I'm going to stop there. If you want to read the rest, do so. But it's really quite a revelation, understanding how it works. The reason why I've included this, everyone, is like I said before, these verses suggest that alcohol was probably the reason why the sons of Aaron did what they did. They may not have been drunk, but they may have been drinking. Remember, it was a time of celebration. The tabernacle had just been dedicated. Aaron, their father, had just been dedicated to be the great high priest. So it was a celebration time. So it's very highly likely that they uh, were uh, celebrating with, with uh, alcohol. Uh, a lot of celebrating was obviously going on. So, but what's interesting is how we read how it affects your brain, your heart your bloodstream. Listen to what Revelation chapter 18, verse 3 says. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Hosea, the prophet, also talks about fornication. And guys, our theme today is consecration to the Lord. And I think the message that is going on here, because when Aaron was told to sit in that tabernacle at the door for seven days and not go out, I actually believe that maybe Aaron was going through what I call a detoxification. For an alcoholic or a drug addict to, to get off, they have to go through a detox, a cold turkey or whatever you want to call it. And Revelation 18.3, what we talked about, talks about the nations are drunk. He doesn't mention alcohol. What is he talking about? He's talking about clear thinking needed. Clear thinking. Look at Leviticus 10.10. 10, that they may put difference between holy and unholy and between clean and unclean. See, if we're intoxicated, I'm not talking about alcohol now. I think there's a deeper message for us. 
when we are intoxicated by wrong thinking, by religious thinking, by an unhealthy thinking, by the ways of the world, by liberal theology, that it's going to affect the way we discern and the way we handle spiritual things. If you look at Hosea chapter 4, listen to what he says. Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land because there's no truth, there's no mercy, there's no knowledge of God in the land. By swearing, lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery, they break out and blood touches blood. By the way, God is talking to his own people here. Therefore shall the land mourn and everyone that dwells shall languish with the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven. The fishes of the sea also shall be taken away. Let no man strive nor reprove another. For your people are as they that strive with the priest. Therefore you shall fall in the day and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night and I will destroy thy mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Notice he touches on the priesthood. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will forget thy children. This also, everyone, takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Remember, Adam and Eve were told there were certain foods that they were allowed to eat from every tree, but there was one area that they were not allowed to eat from, and that was the tree of life. And what happened? They transgressed. They crossed the boundary. They stole from God something that was not theirs. It was robbery. And so now part of our consecration, everyone, part of our consecration and you know the things that god is dealing with you about is we need to detox from things that we've been drinking and feeding on even you know sometimes the news too much feeding on the news or gossip too much gossip do you know that can intoxicate you in a negative way and then there are things even in the physical of course we we learn from physical things we, we all know that eating the wrong foods can have a negative effect on you and drinking the wrong drinks. Now, when it comes to alcohol, there's nothing wrong with having a glass of wine or a glass of beer. We all know that there's a line somewhere. Same with chocolate, same with chocolate cake. There's a line there. We, we all know the, 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 the challenge, the fight, especially when it tastes so good. So consecration, uh, is a real challenge here. And I think if we look at Leviticus chapter 11, he goes into the dietary laws. And so I think the message is loud and clear here, everyone, that he's saying that there are some things you can eat and there are some things you can't eat. There are some things you can do and there are some things you can't do. And it's up to you and me as we work out our salvation to find out. See, the thing is, you may be able to drink two or three or four glasses of wine and it doesn't affect you. I can only maybe drink two or three sips of wine and it can really affect me. Everyone is different. Everyone has their own walk. That's why we, we need to be careful not to judge others who do things, who do things that we may not feel comfortable with. So, um, and you know, a lot of those animals that uh we are told to that we're allowed to eat that we're not allowed to eat there are deeper meaning behind this in general the the rabbis would say that the animals that we are allowed to eat they are more of a passive nature not all ways but they're more of a passive nature whereas the ones that we're forbidden to eat they are more of the uh, the predators or the scavengers nature. And of course, as Einstein 
uh, Albert Einstein said, the three keys to understanding more about God and more about yourself is history, studying nature, and studying the animal world. Have you ever watched those animal programs where you really, uh, you can learn so much, especially the thing that, that I like is when, when um, a mother is protecting uh, her offspring from danger. You really see the protective side uh, of her. And verses of scripture, like Isaiah 66, as a, as a mother watches over her, her, uh, her hen, so the Lord will watch over you. And, um, and then even that verse, which says, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's the one verse that the rabbis use to say we're not allowed to have milk and meat together. We're not allowed to eat cheeseburgers. Well, actually, I read a really interesting commentary saying that actually the, the reason why we're not allowed to boil a kid in its mother's milk is because that is an act of cruelty. Because a, a mother has just given birth to a little kid. Can you imagine you taking that kid and boiling that kid ready to eat it? That's cruel in front of its mother. And the book of Proverbs talks about uh, warning us not to be cruel to animals. So um, there's a lot that can be said about uh, the, the, uh, the dietary laws. But I think in the context that we're talking about, this is all about consecration. This is all about discerning what and what we should and shouldn't eat, drink, take in, take on board. And, uh, and we, know, we know that this is not just about uh, food and drink. As Paul said, the kingdom of God is not food and drink only. That's how we survive. But uh, it's what we feed on in our minds. And we know the Lord said that the, the, the enemy, the devil, he is a liar and the father of all lies. We need to discern what are some of the, the lies that we've been uh, feeding on and detox. And usually if we've got habitual sins, somewhere deep down, the enemy has been feeding us something that we enjoy. It's like a, that, that, that uh, explanation of how alcohol gets into your uh, stream. After a while, it becomes your friend. It's like a dopamine. It has that feel good factor. And somehow we've got to discern what are the things and, and what actually is an enemy has, but we've made it our friend, but we've got to, we've got to face it up and ask for the Lord's grace and go into the tabernacle for seven days, consecrate ourselves back to the Lord. And I love what it says in that passage. In, in chapter eight of Leviticus, there the Lord will atone for you. Nothing we can do, everyone, anyone. It's the Lord's atonement. And of course, this is pointing to only one thing, and that's the sacrificial system. And of course, we see how Yeshua, he's the one that atones for us. But we've got to not only repent, we've got to learn how to detox from some of this negative wrong thinking and we got to feed on the right stuff because it will be food for us it will strengthen us it will equip us to be the priest that god has called us to be now our parasha is shmini which means eight and i talked about how eight is usually symbolic of a, of a new beginning or a new cycle. Interestingly, circumcision is done on the eighth day as well. <clears throat> and um, medically speaking, it's believed that that's the best time to circumcise a child on the eighth day. But we know that a, a deeper meaning to that is circumcision is symbolic of circumcision of the heart as well, which also is a form of 
consecration. Another picture of consecration is being what the Lord calls being born again. And we read in John chapter 3, a story where one of the leaders of Israel, Nicodemus, there was a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. He came, the same came to Yeshua by night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles except you come from God. And how did the Lord answer back? Truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, the Lord later on says, he, he explains what it means to be born again. He said, except a man, uh, in verse 5, uh, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, in those days, water was used to wash people's body, the whole mikvah, the whole baptismal, the ritual purification baths. In fact, Aaron and his sons, especially Aaron, the high priest, before he was ordained, do you know what they did to him? They first had to strip him. Then they had to wash him with water. Then they had to anoint him. One of our verses this week in the parasha is, the anoint, don't go out of the tabernacle because the anointing remains on you, which, I, which is a quote from First John. When John says, the anointing that you've received remains on you. I actually think John was referring to this passage. So the, the water and the spirit, this is what the Lord is talking about being born again. In other words, we need to be struck like Aaron. This is part of like being detoxed, stripped of anything and everything that is hindering, being washed, being cleansed and being reclothed or newly clothed with the righteous garments of the Lord. And this is the this is something we have to put on the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the shoes of peace. The belt of truth. So the Lord has provided it for us. We've got to put it on. Um, another interesting thing. Look what it says. Look what Nicodemus's response was in verse 4 of John 3. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again when he is old? Now, I've, I've mentioned this before. According to Messianic Jewish scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum, he says that historically in the ancient days, a born again experience was something that a Jewish man went through about five times in his life when he had a bar mitzvah and became a man, when he got married, when he had children, when he went into the workforce, and there's one or two other times. And Nicodemus is saying, how can a man be born again when he's old? That's the key phrase. In other words, Nicodemus is saying, I've passed through all those stages. But see, here's the problem. Nicodemus was caught or intoxicated, if I can use that word, with his religion and culture and tradition. See, the Lord was wanting to do a new thing. This is what the number eight means the eighth day something new and but nicodemus he had exhausted everything in his own logic he was still bound by his religion and culture and 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 tradition and the lord he goes on to say in verse 9 uh, uh sorry verse 10 he says are, are, are you a master of israel and you don't know these things verily i say to you we speak what we know and testify what we've seen but you don't receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And then he goes on and he, and he says in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. So he's taking historical things and he's interpreting it in the new way, giving it a deeper spiritual meaning. In some ways, this is what the Kabbalah does. 
they take things and they look at the deeper spiritual lessons. By the way, I'm not promoting the Kabbalah here. By the way, when the Kabbalah first came out, there were many Christian Kabbalists, but sadly it got way, way, way out of balance. And uh, usually the connotations when it comes to Kabbalah is, uh, is, is way out of balance. So, but coming back online, everyone, uh, there's another beautiful picture of consecration in the prophet Ezekiel chapter 47 that I've included in my in our notes. And by the way, my apologies, I forgot to put page numbers in our notes, but on one of the heads of the pages of Ezekiel 47, verse one, a picture of the future temple. Listen to what it says. Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, from right under the house at the south side of the water. Guys, pay attention to these waters, because these are the living waters. Then he brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way unto the utter gate by the way that looked eastward and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man, who is this man, everyone? It says he had a measuring line in his hand. He measured a thousand cubits and he brought me through the waters and the waters were to the ankles. Notice this man, the one who, who's going about measuring. Guys, this is a picture of the Lord. Part of our consecration walk is he's the one who's always measuring us. He's always uh, challenging. He's always sanctifying, always purifying us. And he brings us through the waters. Notice it says, verse three, and he brought me through the waters. But then the waters were ankle deep. Verse four, again, he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. And now the waters were knees deep. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through and the waters were to the loins. Afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river were many trees on one side and on the other, and then he said, these waters issue out towards the east and go down into the desert. This is a picture from the waters going from Jerusalem, everyone, down to the desert, which is barren, and the Dead Sea. Look what it says. And, it, and they go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. A beautiful picture of these living waters that will go down and heal the desert and the Dead Sea. And it came to pass that everything that lives, which moves, the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude of fish because these waters shall come and thither, for they shall be healed. And everything that shall live, the river comes and it shall come to pass that the fishes shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto en Eneglain. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. I see this, everyone. Of course, this is a picture of the millennial temple. But I see there's a beautiful spiritual picture here because those living waters, they proceed from the altar. And the altar is where the blood is shed. And those living waters, it says, everywhere the waters touch shall be healed, shall be made whole, and then shall come forth fruitfulness, trees with leaves for the healing of the nation. This is a miracle. How can, they, how can the Dead Sea be made healed? How can the desert have trees with leaves for the healing of the nations and fish? But this is the power of the living waters, everyone. And this is a picture of what the Lord said in John 7. Whoever believes in me and who abides in me, out of his belly will flow 
rivers of living water. So you and I, as part of this message of consecration, we got to be like Aaron. We got to go into the tabernacle. We got to remain at the door, the Lord. We got to remain there. We got to let the Lord detox us and we got to prepare the way of the Lord. That's what we got to do. Why? Because look at Leviticus 9, 6, everyone. See, this is the reward. I, I said before, I said, this is a hard message. This is very costly. But look at chapter 9, verse 6 of Leviticus. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. See, the, the, the glory of the Lord is this, this miracle. And this is the season of miracles. This is the month of miracles, according to, to Judaism. But with the Lord, everything is according to his time, not our time. So we want to see the glory of the Lord, but we have to do our part. We have to line ourselves up. We have to detox as much as we can. And we need to be voices as well, everyone. For our brothers and sisters, just like John the Baptist was a voice. And Isaiah 40 verse 3, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is, is the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. Because the wind of the Lord blows upon it. Guys, everything in this world, it's, it's temporary. It's all temporary. But. Verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Guys, this is our main source of detoxification. Keep feeding, keep drinking God's word and let it flush out. This is what I believe the Lord meant when he said, the truth shall set you free. And by the way, in John 8, Verses 31 and 32, when he said that, he said, if you continue in my teaching, then you shall be my disciples and you shall know the truth and the truth so, shall set you free. So, guys, we know it's a process. You know, it's not a it's not a, 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 a fast process. It's a gradual process. And this is part of going into that mikvah, that spiritual baptismal pool every day where we bathe in the waters and by the way the hebrew word for a baptismal pool is the word mikveh and it's from the same root word as tikveh tikveh means hope hope that's the name of our national anthem the hatikva but it's from the same root word as the mikveh what is the connection because when you're in those ritual bath pools and you're bathing what are you doing you're letting that water wash you and cleanse you. And it's like being born again, being refreshed, being renewed. Psalm 103, it says, he shall renew your youth as the eagle. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. We must never allow ourselves to grow old, everyone. And I, I'm... I know we can do what we can physically, but I'm not talking about that primarily. Paul said, outwardly we perish, but it's inwardly that we're renewed day by day by day. This is a challenge to never allow ourselves to run dry, to burn out, to renew ourselves and to prepare the way of the Lord as it says in Isaiah chapter 40, goes on, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up to a high mountain. 
Oh, Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Stay unto the cities of Judah. Hine Eloheinu. Behold our God. Behold, the Lord your God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And he shall gently lead those that are with the young. And we know that John the Baptist, he fulfilled that prophecy of Isaiah. Because in Matthew 3, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist fulfilled this prophecy by being the forerunner of the Messiah, by imitating the prophet Elijah. And John's main call was to announce the coming of Yeshua. And guys, you and I, as we follow the example of Aaron, by going into the tabernacle, and who is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is the Lord himself. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He's the tabernacle. He's the door. He said, I am the door. He's the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And he's the living waters that flow from the altar. And wherever we let those waters flow, there will be healing. And so let us detox from anything that we need. And let us feed on the right things, the true, healthy bread of life. And let God's word detoxify us and do away with the bad things that we often digest. And, uh, and Peter, let me finish by saying 1 Peter 5, he says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Notice Peter uses the term, be sober. Guys, here in the Middle East is a good picture. We have many lions, many tigers ready. They are ready to pounce on us like, uh, a, like roaring lions. They're ready to devour us. This is a time we have to be sober. We have to be vigilant. And guys, as we, as, we go, as we abide in the tabernacle, these seven days, you know, that number of perfection, as we abide in the Lord, I believe God's word abiding in us will raise us up in the spirit to be the kingdom of priests. Because it's these days, everyone, our prayers are the most important weapon that we have our prayers and the proclamation of the word of God. And we need not only to be the prophets, but we also need to be the priests to serve our God day and night in the temple. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. And I know you probably could have spent hours on just the eighth day alone. <laughs> um, I was studying the Parsha this week, and I don't know if anybody caught it, but I just thought it was fascinating that the Lord um, destroyed the two men with fire, but then later the uncle's sons were told to come and carry their bodies out of the camp by their tunics. So I thought, well, what's up with that? So one of the rabbis, Rashi, um, had something really interesting to say about it. He says, this tells us that their garments had not been destroyed by the fire, but their souls alone. Neither their clothing nor bodies showed signs of burning. They had been struck by fire inwardly. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting that, you know, when we do things, right, aren't we struck by fire inwardly? You know, it's like that, you know, there's a death, there's yeah. a conviction, but also we can be yeah. struck by fire inwardly in compassion and 
mercy yes. and loving kindness and anyway absolutely absolutely Didi. and by the way there is a messianic prophecy in malachi it says that um and when the lord comes who can stand the day of his coming for he shall come as a refiner's fire so in this context the messiah coming as a refiner's fire it's not to consume us it's to purify it's to sanctify so this is a beautiful thing that that fire not to kill us not to consume us amen well everybody just jump right in if you have any questions or comments thank you aharon this was wonderful i feel like you're kind of the vessel that pours living water into me by teaching me all this. Praise you know? the Lord. Yeah. So um, the setting of this, all of this, was this in Shiloh? Or where, where was this happening? No, the tabernacle... Um... The tabernacle was in the wilderness. That this is before they came into the Holy Land. Uh, now it was it, all these statutes and precepts. It was for the Israelites while they were in the tabernacle, while they were in the desert. However, it was for the future when they come into the Holy Land. And of course, Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle did rest. For uh, I believe it was 369 years. So it would be for future as well. Thank you. Welcome. And and that's a really important point here, everyone, because. Moses is giving all this instruction to the Israelites for the future. Yes, for the present when they're in the desert. But it was really, this was a new way of thinking for the Israelites. They had to change their whole way. So I like that picture because sometimes in, in the church, there's, there's a, it's almost like a whip on us um, to, to get our lives totally sorted out in a matter of five minutes of course i'm exaggerating but for me this is a process this is a lifelong process and that's why i think in um in philippians 2 when paul said we got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling it's a working out we've got a um you know i've been believer for so many years and yet the some of the basics I have to go over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not like any of you that have got their lives totally together and never, uh, never mess up. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> Gary put a lot of nice references in the, the chat that you can read later about the eight and I love the idea of the eighth day in the world to come when we basically step out of time, you know, like everything is so hooked to time. It's like a noose around, even if you try and not do that. I mean, it's like, what time do I have to leave so I can get to this place on time? And, you know, what time is this going to be on? What time yeah. is our Bible study? And what, what time do I need to get started so I'm ready? And, and it's just time, time, time. So the idea of stepping out of time and being in the world to come where everything is, you know, Yeshua is taking care of everything and, you know, defeated all of Israel's enemies. And we're just with the Lord is a wonderful picture. Amen. I have something, Aharon. Um, hey, hey. Um, I know this week the Lord's been highlighting um, the eagle to me and how the 
we will wait upon the Lord. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. We will run and not be weary. We will walk and not faint. And um, I, I did a little background on the eagle. And when it gets older, the eyesight gets bad and the calcium builds up on its beak. And so what it does, it goes onto a high mountain and it lays out in the sun get it, the sun, <laughs> and it lays for hours each day in the sun, as we do in our son, Yeshua, um, and it renews its strength, and it actually renews its strength, like the eyesight, everything gets better, the calcium comes off, or whatever, and then it, I guess it plucks its feathers, or whatever, off, but um, just waiting upon the Lord. Um, a lot of times, like for me, I pray, 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 I pray in tongues, I, um, you know, worship and all that. And now the Lord's telling me, you know, just sit and wait for me and be quiet. <laughs> Cause I think sometimes even in our prayer, we want to do, 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 and, you know, it's about the wait and he wants to, you know, have us just be still and know that he is God and, you know, it is a process <laughs> because yeah. especially when you're, you know, you're praying, 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 you know, you're praying for this or that. And he just says, be still and just be quiet. Um, so we're all in our different degrees of development. But yeah, so I just wanted to point that out. That is beautiful, John. Mm -hmm. I, you know, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd heard that an eagle, when it plucks its feathers out, it, it go, you know, before it doesn't yeah. goes high. Yeah. And it waits in the sun, but I never heard the part about the eyes. That is really yeah. profound. Yes, I guess the sun um, will make it. I don't know how it does. It, it looks in the sun. So it looks at the sun with its eyes. So for some reason, it does get better. Like we would look intently on Jesus, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, it makes sense because... I mean, I don't understand so much in the physical, but obviously there's something about the elevation of yeah. the sun. Because in the same way, when you, uh, I learned this, when you go to the Dead Sea, it's mm -hmm. not just the waters and the minerals and the salts that heal skin issues. Mm -hmm. Apparently it's the lowest part on the face of the earth, the Dead Sea. And it's the low altitude sun also that is part of healing of the skin. So if it does things at a lower level, it can also do things in the higher level. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, so in the hills and the valleys. So we got the mountaintops and in the valleys. He's the lily of the valley. So even in our local. Amen. You know? Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's right. Good, good word. Thank you. <laughs> That was beautiful. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, Didi. Well, Gary, how about <laughs> Gary? Yeah, Gary, what you got to share, brother? Uh, first of all, I want to tell you how how proud of you I am. Oh, wow. Gary, good, great teaching, Joanne. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you to the Lord for you for your insight as far as the eagle. And uh, I just want to also say, praise God that that God's taken another layer off, off of you, Aaron, as far as your mother wounds. The mother wounds have, have disappeared. And, yeah. Or they're just That's right. I mean, praise That's God. That's true. You know? So uh, I'm sure a boulder, another boulder has come off your shoulders, my brother. But, yes. Uh, I wanted to, you know, you mentioned detoxification as far as the theme of the reading. But also, I think the theme is also the, a godly fear of the Lord. And I just want to share that, what I wrote about that. Uh, many people believe that God's anger towards those who disregard his holiness is only relevant to the God of the uh, Tanakh, who focused on law and justice. But they argued that since the Bidat Shah came into being with Messiah Yeshua, we are now so-called under grace and immune from God's judgment. However, the account of Ananias and Sapphira reveals that this is, not, this is definitely a fallacy. This couple brought an offering to the apostles in Jerusalem and lied to the Ruach HaKodesh, about how much money they received for the sale of their property. Uh, and that's in Acts 5, 1, 1 and 2. So for lying to God, both Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead. So although God is love, 
merciful, patient, compassionate, and slow to anger, we also must not take these qualities for granted nor test our God for, by treating his holiness care, carelessly. God is equally just and holy, but for the reason he is called a consuming fire throughout the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. So my, the purpose is maybe, maybe walk in a healthy fear of the Lord, which will keep us in, on a narrow road that leads to life. Because in Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So I believe we are now in a time of new beginning as we have entered into the beginning of these last days and God is now extending a new beginning to his Jewish people. And um, Amen. a healthy fear of the Lord is, is what we need to have and um, not just take it for granted. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, are you ready to close us in prayer? Yes, I am. Hallelujah. Father God, we are humbled at this word, which um, is such a challenge to us. And yet, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that uh, you've given us um, your word as a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you, Lord, that we have a safety net, the, 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 the safety net of your grace, your mercy, your patience, your kindness, your long suffering towards us. Thank you, as you, your word says, as a, as a uh, man pities his children, so the Lord has pity on you. And we thank you, Lord, for your hand of love over our lives as we shared last week your banner over us is love lord we praise you and we thank you and lord as we dedicate ourselves afresh to you lord may we be sober minded and may you show us any patterns any thought patterns in our lives lord that we need to break that we need to break clear of and we need to detox from lord Show us how to do that. Give us, um, as, as it says in Isaiah 40, you will shepherd your sheep. So be our shepherd, Lord, and may we hear your voice speaking to us and guiding us. Pray your blessing on everyone here in the study and those who are watching through the recording. In Yeshua's name, amen. Gary. Amen. If you can please all unmute while I share a blessing of the Lord. And John Hodges, please don't put both hands up while you're driving, my brother. <laughs> Receive the blessing of the Lord. Yivarechecha Adonai v'nish melecha, Yair Adonai p'navalecha v'chonecha, Yisai Adonai p'navalecha, Yisimlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his hands upon each and every one of you and feel it overflowing with his shalom, with his peace. B'shem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. Adonai our Lord, Moshe'enu our Redeemer. Pelio Etz, wonderful counselor. El Gibor, mighty God. Aviad, everlasting father. And Sar Shalom, the prince of everlasting peace. And all of God's people says, Amen. 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 Amen.